Hey, good morning everybody. This is Mr. Ainsworth. We're going to get into a uh, review on limits and continuity here in Chapter 1 in Calculus. and We're going to use this graph here to evaluate left-hand limits and right-hand limits and we're going to use it to evaluate some functions too. So given this piecewise function here in the graph, let's take a look at the limit of f of x as x approaches negative 1 from the left. Okay, and negative 1 is right here on the, on the graph. And when you approach it from uh, the left, right here, uh, negative 1 from the left, notice that there's no function in between negative, uh, negative 2 and negative 1. So since the function doesn't exist there, uh, the limit doesn't even exist. Okay, so let's state that. The limit doesn't exist, does not exist. Uh, what is the limit of f as you approach 1 from the right? or excuse me, one from the left. Okay, well here's one, and when you approach one from the left-hand side, the function values are decreasing to two. All right, all these y values are decreasing to two, so we say that the left-hand limit as you approach one is two. And what's the limit of the function as you approach negative one from the right? Okay, that means you gotta come in this way from the right of negative one. This one here has a limit. Okay, so the function values are decreasing to 2. All right, so they, we say that the right-hand limit as you approach negative 1 is 2. What's the limit of the function as you approach 0 from the right? Okay, if you approach 0 from the right, uh, let me change, erase some of the values here in the arrow so you can see this. Here's 0, and you're coming in from the right. The function values are increasing to a height of 3, 1, 2, 3. That's a height of 3 right here. So they're increasing there as you approach 0 from the right. So we say the limit of the function is 3 at that point from the right. And what is the limit of the function as you approach 1 from the right? Okay, well here is 1. As you approach it from the right, there's no function that exists there. Uh, so how can a limit exist? Okay, it's not possible there. Uh, what's the limit of the function as you approach 0 from the left? Well, that's possible. So if you come in from the left side of 0, the function is increasing right here to 3. Okay, so we say the left-hand limit as you approach 0 is 3. Now, these right here, you just evaluate each function at these points. Okay, so at negative 1, um, all you do is you let me switch to green here. At negative 1, you go from negative 1 up to the function. And notice it's open there. It's undefined. Okay. So we don't say it does not exist, we say undefined. Okay, f is 0. f is 0, you just go right up to the function, it's 3. f of 2, uh, here's 2, go where it's closed, uh, it's negative 1. So negative 1 there, f of 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, so here's 4, the y value there is 0. All right? So you're going to be given a graph here, and you're going to be asked to find left and right hand limits and limits in general, and you're going to be asked to evaluate the function at, at a particular point. Pretty straightforward. And then you have to here use your techniques, okay, using, uh, using the techniques that you've learned through the chapter, and there are many. So use your notes on this one. Here you have to factor. So here you want to factor and simplify. Okay, and you want to handle that. So this is equivalent to x plus 3 uh, times x squared plus, excuse me, minus. I'm going to change the sign there. Minus 3x plus 9. All divided by x plus 3. You want to remove the discontinuity right there and evaluate this and you want to substitute that in. So what do you get? You get uh, negative 3 squared minus 3 times negative 3 plus 9. And that's equal to uh, 9 of 9 is 18, plus 9, that's 27. 27. Okay, and what is this, this limit here? As you approach 0 from the right, uh, you're getting extremely small, and 1 divided by an extremely small number is extremely big. Okay, and so this one's going to be infinity, just by inspection here. You can take 1 divided by, let's say, uh, you know, 1, 1 divided by 0 0.0001 squared, and that's extremely big. All right, this is a big number, and it's approaching infinity here. And you can also take a look at the graph, too. If you remember the graphs on this one here? Okay, 
If you are approaching zero from the right, and this is zero, then it's going up, okay? And likewise on this one here, if you approach uh, two from the left, uh, what's going to be happening here? Approach two from the left, you get extremely close to two from the left, you're about 1.99. And let's see, 1.99 minus two is negative 0 0.01, and one divided by 0 0.01 is equal to 100. So this one's taking, uh, oh, it's in negative, uh, negative 100 there. It's taken off to negative infinity. So we say this limit is negative infinity as you're approaching from infinity. So you can verify with the calculator. So verify uh, with calc. Also, you should be able to graph this function. If you graph this, you have a vertical asymptote at 2, 1, 2, right here at 2. And then you have a two-part function here. It's going to be looking like this and like this. And so as you approach 2 from the left, it's going down. The function values are decreasing to negative infinity there at 2, okay, when you approach 2 from the left. So you have to know your basic graphs, and you, know have to, you have to know it by using number sense, too. Plug a number in close to 2 from the left and substitute in. Go into trace mode or just do it mentally like I did, and then you'll get a value, all right, and then determine that. Um, here, you go to directly, direct substitution, direct substitution here, and let's get a value there. So you have uh, 2 minus 3 times 2 squared all divided by 2 squared plus 2. 4 times 3 is 12. 2 minus 12 is negative 10. 4 and 2 is 6, so negative 10 6 or negative 5 thirds. Okay, these are your special limits right here. The special limits uh, you're required to memorize. So you want to memorize this one, memorize this one. And this one here, if you recall in your notes, um, uh, it has a limit of 1, and this one it has a limit of 0. So you got to memorize these. Okay. Uh, So let me see. Memorize. Okay. Uh, let me see. How can a limit fail to exist? Okay. What are the three ways? Okay. Go back into your notes. The very first thing we we discovered is that at a jump or discontinuity, the limit fails to exist. Okay. So a discontinuity. A limit can fail to exist there. Uh, a discontinuity or a jump, and it's where the um, actually let's, let's and this happens when the uh, left and right hand limits uh, are different. Okay, so what happens here at a at a jump or a discontinuity is that the left and r left okay and right hand limits do not agree with each other. Okay, they are different. Left and right hand limits, okay, are different. All right, if that's the case, the limit can't exist there, and that occurs at a discontinuity or a jump, as you guys see. Something that looks like maybe something like this. It goes up and then takes off that way. So at C right here, the limit fails to exist because the left and right hand limits are different. Number two, uh, we saw that if uh, the limit approaches either positive or negative infinity, it fails to exist. So um, when f of x uh, approaches either positive uh, or negative infinity, all right, limit fails to exist. Limit fails to exist. Okay, a good example of that was this function here. When we had, uh, when we took a look at the limit of, let's say, 1 over x squared as x approaches 0. Okay, this does not exist because uh, as you approach 0 here from the left, the function value approaches positive infinity. All right, positive infinity on both sides, by the way. Whether you approach from the left, okay, or from the right, uh, the function values increase without bound and they go up to positive infinity. The third case uh, that we saw 
was when uh, f of x oscillates between two fixed values. So when f of x oscillates, I mean it goes up and down, okay, oscillates, is the key word, uh, between two fixed values, okay, as x approaches c, as x approaches c, the target point. We saw that, uh, the famous case there, is that uh, when f of x is equal to, the, let's say, the sine of uh, 1 over x, and we took a look at the limit of sine of 1 over x as x approaches 0, okay, that does not exist. That was a good example of a function whose limit does not exist because of this oscillating behavior, okay, keyword oscillate. So we have three ways a limit can fail to exist, can fail to exist. When, there's, when the left and right hand limits don't agree with each other, okay, and that happens at a jump here, uh, when f of x approaches positive or negative infinity, and a third case, when f of x oscillates as x approaches c, and I gave examples of each, okay? Uh, let's see here. State the three-part test for continuity at a point. Okay, well, first of all, first, uh, f of c must be defined. Okay, must be defined. Okay, second, uh, the limit must exist. Limit uh, must exist, and if it does, you need to be able to find it. Must exist. So that means that the limit of the function f as x approaches c must be equal to a real number, guys. And for that to happen, the left and right hand limits must be the same. So if it exists, it equals a real number, and that means the left and right hand limits must be the same. And then these two conditions must be equal. Okay, so third uh, is that f of c must be equal to the limit, otherwise there's going to be a hole in the graph. So the third condition is that the limit of the function, I call it f of x, as x approaches c, better be equal to f of c. First and uh, first case and excuse me, first and second steps must be equal. Okay? Must be equal in order for the third step to happen. If all three conditions are met, okay, then you have continuity at that point. All right, and that's, uh, I believe, section 1-4. We also did a cool warm-up on that, too. Now, because we know that, let's describe the continuity at various points and explain the results. If the function is not continuous at the point state each step of the, step of the three, uh, it fails uh, the continuity test. Where does it fail? Step 1, 2, or 3. So let's take a look at that. Uh, at 1 here, at x equals 1, all right, it's not continuous. Okay, it's not continuous, obviously, because there's a hole there. All right, why? Because even though the limit is equal, there's a limit exists right here, uh, f of 1, let me see, this is 4 and this is 5. Right here, uh, f of 1 equals 5, you get, but the limit is 4, okay? So the reason why it's not continuous because uh, f of 1 equals 5, all right, but the limit, okay, uh, the function as you approach 1 equals 4, and these are obviously not equal, all right? The point is not, I mean, the whole, there's a hole in the graph, guys, and the reason why is because the point f of 1 is 5, not 4. If f of 1 was 4, then this would be closed, and you'd have continuity at that point. So it's not continuous because f of 1 equals 5, but the limit's 4. All right, step 3 fails. Okay, they're not equal. Step 3 fails here. Okay, at negative 1, what's happening there? Well, here's negative 1 right here. Uh, if you go up to the graph right here, it's continuous there. And the reason why is because the limit equals the function value. The function value is uh, around 3.5 or so. All right? So it's continuous there. This function is continuous at negative 1. Um, at 2, let's see, at 2 right here, and no, 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 no. It's definitely continuous there because there's no holes or breaks in the graph. So it's continuous. At 3, no, 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 no. Okay, we got a problem. There's a hole there. All right? So it's not continuous here. Okay, because uh, f of 3 is undefined. Step 1 has failed, so it is undefined. 
So you're going to have to tell me whether it's continuous or not, and if it's not, tell me why not. Is FC defined? Does the limit exist? Does it not exist? Does the limit not equal the function value at that point? You've got to tell me which part of the three-step failed. Okay. Okay, the intermediate value theorem. The intermediate value theorem states the following. Let me describe what's going on first before I answer these questions here. Okay, now the intermediate value theorem states the following here. Let me get, where'd my, go, where'd it go? Okay, here we go. All right, so let's suppose we have a function here. That keeps on disappearing. All right, and let's suppose that f of x is here, and we have our coordinate plane here, and let's suppose that uh, uh, this is a, and over here is b, this is f of a, the function evaluated at that point, over here is f of b. All right, the intermediate value theorem states that there, uh, if, okay, if, and let me grab a red pen here, there we go, if k is between f of a and f of b, okay, and these are going to be real numbers of course, so if k is between f of a and f of b here, there exists a c somewhere between a and b such that f of c equals k, okay, this equals uh, f of c, okay? Why? Because it's the function evaluated at that point. So let me repeat that. If k is between these two y values, f of a and f of b, then there exists a c somewhere inside or in between a and b such that f of c equals k. That's if the function is continuous. So we're going to assume, uh, we're going to assume f of x uh, is continuous okay, on the closed interval from A to B, so it's continuous, that means there are no breaks, holes, or gaps in the function, and if that's the case, then, and if, uh, if, let's say K is between, okay, between, uh, let's say F of A and F of B, fancy way of writing that is this, F of A less than or equal to K less than or equal to F of B, if k is between f of a and f of b, and f is continuous, and f is continuous on the entire closed interval, so from a to b, okay, then the intermediate value theorem states uh, the following. Then there exists, okay, uh, a k, or excuse me, a c, okay, value c here, c, okay, element of, okay, or inside the closed interval from A to B, all right, such that F of C equals K. That's what the intermediate value theorem, intermediate value uh, theorem states. Now, that's assuming that F is continuous. So let's check this out. Let's apply it. Okay, first of all, this is a polynomial, and all polys are continuous. Okay, so all polynomials, okay, are continuous everywhere, are continuous uh, everywhere. So we're cool on that part. The only thing we also need to check, and we have to check two things, the fact that it's continuous, and we have to see if my k, uh, which is k equals 11 in this case, all right, is between f of a and f of b. So I have to evaluate f of 0 and f of 5. So f of 0 is 0 squared plus 0 minus 1 equals negative 1 there f of 5, what's that? Well, it's 5 squared plus 5 minus 1. 25 minus plus 5 is 30 minus 1, 29. And notice that 11 is between negative 1 and 29. So, uh, 11 is between, all right, negative 1 and 29. All right, so intermediate value theorem applies. It's continuous, and k is between these two y values. All right, so go back to my little... Uh, discussion earlier here, let's say, you know, here this is uh, f of a is negative 1, and then f of b is 29, 
you know, and this is 11. It's between these two y values. That means there exists a c inside uh, 0, 5, such that uh, the function evaluated at that point equals 11. So what I want to do is set the function equal to 11 and solve for that c value. So what we're going to do is we're going to take x squared, we're going to find c now, uh, plus x minus 1, we're going to set it equal to 11, and we're going to solve for that. Okay? So I'm going to subtract 11, so we get x squared plus x minus uh, 12 now equals 0. That's x plus 4 times x minus 3 equals 0. And then I get x equals negative 4 and positive 3 is my possible results, my possible c values, possible uh, c values. All right? But which one's in the interval? 3 is, but not negative 4. All right? So that tells me all right, that c equals 3 and not negative 4 because 3 is inside all right, my interval from 0 to 5. All right, so I know c is equal to 3. Not negative 4 because 4, this one right here is outside, okay, 0 comma 5. Okay? So I have only one c value there. Let's try it again. The very first thing you need to test is whether the intermediate value term applies. That's why I said verify. Okay, so let's do this. It's a polynomial again. So polynomials are continuous everywhere. Are continuous everywhere. Okay, that's good. All right. Uh, I have to check whether 4, this is my k, is between f of 0, and this is my a and that's my b, and f of 3. So I've got to do some homework here. So I substitute in 0, I get negative 2. Substitute in 3, and I get 27 minus 9 plus 3 minus 2. That's 30 minus 9 is 21, minus 2, 19. So I get 19 there. So 4 is between negative 2 and 19. So you say that, okay? you got to say that. you got to verify it. So 4 is between uh, negative 2 and 19. you got to tell me what's going on. Does the intermediate value theorem apply? Well, you've got to make sure it's continuous on the interval, and the k value, 4 in this case, is between f of a and f of b, f of 0 and f of 3. And it is, because 4 is between negative 2 and 19. Once that happens, then you go for it. You apply the theorem. You take the function here, um, and you set it equal to 4, and you solve that. So, so let's subtract uh, 4, and you get x cubed minus x squared plus x minus 6 equals 0. And at this point, you know, you're probably going to have to try some uh, the synthetic division, probably, I'm, I'm guessing, to see if uh, you can factor this, because you've got to factor this. So you know what? I'm going to, oh, let's see, go over up to the side and try possible factors. Looking at the 6 here, possible factors are 1, 2, 3, and 6, the factors of 6. So possible uh, factors are 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, and plus or minus 6. So using synthetic division here, let's try, um, let's not, uh, erase the 0. Uh, let's try 1. Let's see if it works. 1, let's take the coefficients here. 1, ooh, take that back. Uh, I didn't mean to do that. I'm going to have to get my highlighter here. Coefficients, 1, negative 1, 1, and negative 6. So 1, negative 1, 1, and negative 6. Okay, so 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, negative 5. That doesn't work. Let's try negative 1. So 1, negative 1, 1, negative 6. Okay, 1, negative 1, negative 2, 2. Uh, this doesn't work either, so... Let's try 2. Uh, let's see here. Let's get some more space. So let's try 2. So 1, negative 1, 1, negative 6. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 6, 0. Okay, so there you go. This, now it's a factor. So I got x squared uh, minus or times the quantity x squared plus x plus 3 equals 0. That's my factoring after using synthetic division. 
And let's see, this can't be factored, so sometimes it can, but this one can't. So my only possibility for 0 is 2, so x equals 2. 2 is inside the interval from 0 to 3, so it's in the closed interval from 0 to 3. Uh, so therefore, my conclusion is that c equals 2 by the intermediate value theorem. Okay, that was a challenge. You want to call it for synthetic division and factoring uh, using your techniques you learned in Algebra 2. All right. Okay, so number 14, uh, we want to use the squeeze principle here. Uh, uh, I, didn't, I don't think I meant to say the squeeze principle, so let's cross that out. We, can, we don't need that. Okay, first of all, when it comes to limits to infinity here, we just have to look at the degrees. And I notice that my degrees are the same, so all I have to do is look at the leading coefficients, 5 and 3. And, come on. And I can see that the limit's going to be 5 thirds. That's only true if, the, if you have for a limit to infinity here. However, I taught you guys the technique and I said divide everything all by the highest degree term and then evaluate. So let's do that. So the limit as x approaches infinity of, uh, let's say, 5 plus 1 over x minus 50 divided by x squared. I'm dividing all terms by x squared here. All divided by 3 minus 2 divided by x. Now, when you take a limit to infinity, these fractions are going to be going to 0. Why? Because the denominator is getting increasingly large and the fractions are going increasingly small. And because of that, they have limits of 0. So because of that, you have a limit of 5 plus 0 minus 0 divided by 3 minus 0. And you get 5 thirds. So we have a limit of 5 thirds. But because the degrees are the same, you can look at the coefficients here too. So I expected that in the beginning, but that's, this is technically why it is the way it is. Okay, now... Uh, one more time here, we got going to negative infinity here. So I'm going to divide by x here. The highest degree is x, so divide all terms by x. And I get the limit as x approaches negative infinity. Uh, 1 minus 2 divided by x divided by 5 divided by x minus 3. Okay, the fractions uh, have limits of 0. All right, and what do we get? Uh, we get... W <clears throat> we get 1 divided by negative 3, which is negative 1 third. You can verify that with a calculator, too. Uh, verify with the calc, calculator and graph, okay? You can see what I'm talking about. Now, this one here, we're going to have to use a squeeze theorem because it involves a trig function. So, squeeze it, all right? So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that we know that the um, negative 1 is less than or equal to sine of x, which is less than or equal to 1, and I'm going to try to build the function here. Build, okay, the function, okay, and squeeze it, all right, between two known functions. Between two functions, you can find the limits of it. So what I want to do is multiply everything through by negative 1 first to get the negative there. So I get 1 greater than or equal to negative sine x, greater than or equal to negative 1. I'm going to add 5 now to all parts. I'm trying to generate the numerator there. So I get 6 greater than or equal to 5 minus sine x, greater than or equal to 4. And then as, uh, as, x, travels, uh, as x travels to infinity, then x minus 7 is greater than 0, which means the inequalities don't change because it's positive, okay? And so when I divide everything through by x minus 7, the inequalities hold. So I get 6 divided by x minus 7 greater than or equal to 5 minus sine x divided by x minus 7 greater than or equal to 4 divided by x minus 7. All right, now I take the limit, okay, of each part. So I want to take the limit of 6 divided by x minus 7 as x approaches infinity, greater than or equal to the limit as x approaches infinity of the middle function here, which is 5 minus sine x divided by x minus 7. That's got to be greater than or equal to the limit of 4 divided by x minus 7 as x travels to infinity. So what are these limits? Well, let's see here. The, here, if I set 
uh, actually it's become an infinite large minus 7, so you get 6 divided by an infinite large number, which has a limit of 0. This has the same limit over here. So our limit in the middle, the one that we're trying to find, the, trying to find is squeezed between two, two equal values, and they're both 0. And if, these, uh, if this limit here is squeezed between two zeros, well, it's got to be 0, too. This is equal to 0. So by the squeeze theorem, the limit uh, as x approaches infinity of 5 minus sine x divided by x minus 7 equals 0, okay, by the squeeze theorem. Okay, there you go. And that's the uh, review part one. There's more. There's a book assignment here, too, that you need to do. And so make sure you handle that as well. And uh, do your best, and I'll see you in class for part two.